Om Tat Sat, this is Swami Nikhilananda and welcome to Spirituality and Vedanta Philosophy. My humble prostrations to the Universal Divine Energy, to my worshipful Guru, Sri Swami Jyotirmanandji Maharaj of Miami, Florida, to all the sages and saints of the world and to you divine souls that are watching this video. In um, today's video, we are going to discuss about a very significant contributor of Sanatana Dharma. Uh, his contributions are so huge that no matter what I say, it's like showing a small tea light candle in front of the sun. Um, but that's all we can do. Before we start um, the Bhaj Govindam scripture, uh, a scripture of 31 verses written by Shankaracharyaji himself, I wanted to introduce uh, you about this great sage so we all understand his contributions, uh, not only to Sanatan Dharma but also to the world. <laughs> So, uh, and all the sannyasa order was also started by him. So, very tremendous um, individual with great impact on humanity. Uh, so, he coined uh, the term or he popularized the term Brahma Satyam Jagatamithya Jivo Brahmaivana Paraha. So, if you are a serious spiritual aspirant, you've probably heard this term which is a part of the Advaita philosophy. Advaita means non-dual, where he is um, guiding us that Brahman or the eventual God is the only truth. Jagat Mithya, Jagat the world we live in is an illusion and Jivo Brahmaivana Paraha, which means that the Jiva or the individual soul is the same as the cosmic soul. This is a part and that is the whole and therefore we, our job is to eventually merge back into the whole. So a um, lot of people get confused about this term when we say the world is an illusion. That does not mean that the world does not exist. Of course it exists when you are dealing in your day-to-day -day life but it's compared to your dream just like your dream exists when you're dreaming. Something does show up, the pictures, the sounds show up but when you wake up the dream is not there. It, it did not, uh, in your waking reality the dream doesn't exist. The same thing pretty much happens in the Advaita philosophy also where once you wake up from the life process which is enlightenment or self-realization this world process at that point terminates but till that point the pain is real your practical realities are real so um, Sanatana Dharma and Advaita philosophy another confusion a lot of people have is they think uh, Shankaracharya ji uh, created the Advaita philosophy or he was the founder of Advaita philosophy that is also a myth he popularized the Sanatana Dharma knowledge from the Vedas and he took this knowledge to the common people and this comes from Niralamba Upanishad, the Advaita philosophy, the non-dual aspect. So he was born as an incarnation of Lord Shiva. Um, Shankaracharya ji and his date of birth is also disputed. The traditional authentic Indian um, Shankaracharya Peethas even today they claim that his date of birth um, is 509 BC so before Christ but some western philosophers disputed that and they have called it 788 AD. So um, the history doesn't matter so much. Everybody agrees to his tremendous contributions that he did to the world and his great impact. His father, Shankaracharya's father passed away when he was only three years old. And he learned to read and write at the age of three and he was composing his own philosophical work, poems, etc. by the age of, get this, by the age of six years old. In uh, three short years, Shankaracharya ji, he went to school at five and in three short years he completed all the studies of the Vedas and everything the teacher could impart him, all the teachers, just imagine that. So he was eight years old and he completed the entire Gurukul studies by then and his devotion was so pure that people witnessed many, many miracles under him. One of the examples is when he was asking from, for alms, bhiksha was a common thing for the students at the time living in the ashrams. So uh, he went to get bhiksha from a poor lady's home and she did not have anything. So she was frantically looking to give something to a sannyasi. 
or to this uh, to this bhikshuk to the student and um, sorry not a sannyasi at that point he was not a sannyasi he was only a student getting uh, um, his studies done but uh, his knowledge was so profound so she wanted to give him some arms and she found a dried uh, old gooseberry and that's all she gave him and she had tears rolling down his eyes when he um, saw that and even though he was so young he took it with a lot of devotion and with a lot of thanks and he instantly chanted a pro prose a poem to L goddess Lakshmi the goddess of wealth to say what beautiful devotion this poor person has and um, they say at that time goddess Lakshmi was so moved by his poem that she started dancing and throwing golden gooseberries at that poor lady's house and she obviously became quite affluent after that. So that's one of the things we hear about him. Uh, and then um, uh, another thing he realized uh, as a student that his mother was getting old and you know they had a river, they didn't have running water at that time in the homes. So the mother would go down with her pail of water down and um, down the mountain and then pick it up and then come back. So the journey was very tiring for her and um, so he meditated upon that and um, they say the river changed its course and uh, the next morning when the mother woke up she found that the river was flowing just yards away from her house so she didn't have to walk all the time going down and bringing it up so such was his um, his devotion that he was able to um, do some of these super normal things with his bhakti and devotion. Um, so uh, at the tender age of eight, eight years old, he wanted to um, take sannyasa. He wanted to not get into the householder's life and he wanted to help humanity. Obviously, he's one of the avatars of uh, Lord Shankara, Lord Shiva. So therefore, his name was also Shankaracharya. So his destiny um, guided him that way. And he was the only child of his mother. Father had passed away, so she had a lot of hopes from him. But uh, um, anyway, one day he was bathing in the river and a crocodile caught his leg. And he urged his mother to grant him permission to take sannyasa so he could live. And uh, the mother obviously was panicking because the son was uh, bleeding with his leg caught by a crocodile and the saying goes that she released him because she said better for him to be alive in a sannyasi than to be dead uh, right now. So she told him it's okay he could take sannyasa and he um, they say a miracle happened and the crocodile left him and uh, he came out and then the mother hugged him and said let's go and be thankful and thank God for your for all the prayers and um, and offer our appreciation to God for saving your life at that time he said uh, mother humble prostrations to you and this is this instant my sannyas begins so I cannot go home anymore and uh, he said now my home is the entire earth and my roof is the entire sky Imagine eight years old at that age when he decided to to do that and um, move on. So um, his mother uh, then was crying and he turned back and he says, Mother, you gave me permission. Why are you crying? And she says, well, you're my only son. I do need you whenever, promise me when I call you, you will come. Because at that time, uh, the last rites are considered a very big thing. And for that reason, for the son to, to do those things was considered really big. And, and Shankaracharyji told her, absolutely, whenever she called him, he would come to her uh, at that point. So Shankaracharyaji then um, went to the Himalayas and uh, walked and did all his penance and he found his guru Govinda Bhagavad Pada and he was overjoyed. His guru was overjoyed, ecstatic to see a student like Shankara because when he asked him, 
what's your name? He said, name of who? My body, my mind, my senses. I don't know. I don't have a name. I'm, that's why I need a guru. I'm trying to find out. So at that age, he was so advanced that he knew he was not the body, mind, intellect, ego. None of these things which are transient. So, um... And then when his master taught him, they said he was like a sponge. He would absorb everything that the master would bless him with. And um, later he composed voluminous, unparalleled works that brought to light the, in, the huge, Im immense wisdom of Sanatana Dharma philosophy in Shankaracharya's way of explaining all those things. It was very lucid. So... Um, so after meeting his guru, getting all the guidance, his guru blessed him to go and uh, spread this uh, great wisdom and the knowledge. And at the time, Hindu uh, Hinduism or Sanatan Dharma was fragmented into many, 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 many pieces. Even within Hinduism itself, there were many fragments like Mimansa and other places, not to mention, of course, Buddhists, which had uh, separated from Siddhartha and Gautam Buddha, and then also the Jains and, uh, and other other so many sects so um, Hinduism was on very shaky grounds at that time your Sanatana Dharma and of course um, uh, at that point Shankaracharya ji came due to the divine will and therefore we call him the avatara of Lord Shiva or uh, Lord Shankara um, so after getting uh, some education he went to Banaras which is now called Varanasi the holiest of spots at the banks of river Ganga and um, they say there he met a sage and uh, later um, Shankaracharya ji found out it was Lord Ved Vyas himself Lord Ved Vyas who is the um, from the ancient order of sannyasa he is one of the oldest uh, sages and he said to shankara uh, shankaracharya ji he says did you know that you were to live for only eight years that was the life that lord shiva had granted for you to come and make an impact in the world and he says um, by the time you were eight, the crocodile caught you and you became a sannyasi. They say when you become a sannyasi, you get another birth, so to speak. So another eight years was granted to you. So he became 16 at that age. And uh, by then, um, Shankaracharya ji had already completed his full commentary on Brahma Sutras, which is, is an extremely complicated subject for even big philosophers to understand. But he had already uh, documented it, written it, and at that time, papers were not even very easily available. Um, so Vyasa gave him another 16 years. He says, I, Ved Vyasa, according to, with blessings from Lord Shiva, we are going to give you another 16 years for you to complete this math massive volume of work that is in front of you because they fully understood the scope of the project. It was very large and a lot had to be achieved. And the goal was to unite and bring the Hindus back under the Sanatana Dharam umbrella, imagine, to create a um, message of scriptures and um, to carry this message to all four corners of India. Those of you who have not gone to India, you, uh, you know that India is a melting pot of different cultures and it is just amazing how many different languages, culture, and everything exists, different ways to pray and so on. And Shankaracharya ji um, went through all the east, west, north and south and created his uh, a spiritual order and a structure um, where it's being followed even today. So that was the contribution. That's why we are, uh, I'm paying homage to this great saint. Uh, and we are all part of the Shankaracharya lineage. Any sannyasi you see, any authentic sannyasi, they're called Dashnamis. So they are part of this um, uh, pratha, this tradition that um, Adi Shankaracharya ji has started. Um, so his guru at that point, of course, um, was getting very old and uh, Shankaraji, uh, Acharya ji came to get his blessing and by that time he was gaining a lot of popularity. People liked the way he preached, the, the way he was um, communicating the messages and he saw his guru same in deep in the Himalayas meditating and feeling very cold and quite um, old um, and... Uh, 
just imagine in the Himalayas, extremely cold environment. Shankara uh, took pity, um, not pity, but he felt like he owed his guru something and he started looking frantically for um, some water or to make his life, his guru a little more comfortable. And he, they said he meditated a little and he found a, a, an ice, a place of ice where he dug deeper and uh, as he picked it, uh, a stream of water came out and it was hot water. So, in the, and those exist even today, hot springs. So those were the, um, uh, that was a small gift he gave his guru to make his last days more comfortable. Uh, so his life, he could, he could take um, a good hot shower and also get refreshed in the cold Himalayan mountains. So uh, his real Guru Dakshina, of course, was spreading his teachings, uh, the Guru's teachings, but also so he made his uh, physical life a little bit comfortable. And then he proceeded to Kailash Mountain, uh, where he had the divine vision of Lord Shiva and his guru conversing to each other. So uh, Shankaracharya ji actually in Kailash had that vision. And he, um, they say, uh, Lord Shiva came and blessed him and he spent some time there. And uh, he prayed to him as Dakshinamurti at that time. Uh, and um, he came down from the Kailash mountain he went to Badrinath and there he received a divine vision of Lord Narayana Lord, Lord Vishnu Lord Narayana to create a holy temple at the very spot where the hot water springs had come out from he says that's where the and he was guided so when Shankaracharya ji went in a little deeper he dove and uh, and he found an idol and he brought it up it was of Lord Narayana himself and he brought that and that's where the temple was was consecrated nearby and it's called Badri Narayan. It's a very spiritually charged place um, and uh, Lord Narayana is worshipped in that form. So um, this is once that was built, that temple was built, Sanatana Dharma, people who were um, Hindus uh, started uniting together. They now had a, a, a place, a mission to, to, to get connected to. Um, so that was uh, where his uh, contribution was starting to show. Then um, one day in his meditation, he saw his mother asking him, calling for him. So he knew it was um, probably her time to depart from this earth. So he left everything and he um, went to his to see his mother. And um, he reached her on her deathbed and uh, he prayed to Shankara because he was uh, very connected to Lord Shiva and uh, then her mother um, said she instantly saw Shiv Ganas. Now Shiv Ganas are hideous looking. They don't have, they may have three eyes or two ears or whatever and so she got scared of their looks and uh, uh, told her son that she's um, not at ease. She's finding um, fear and then immediately Lord um, uh, Shankaracharya ji prayed to Lord Krishna because she was more praying to Lord Krishna. And as soon as she prayed to Lord Krishna, she, uh, as Shankaracharya ji prayed, she could see, the mother could see uh, divine angels uh, who were dressed like uh, Vishnu avatars and um, very nice. And she had a smile on her face when she passed away and, uh, and dying in her own son's arms. So for the promise that he had made to his mother, mind you, he was a sannyasi and back in 500 BC, this was a very, um, very unorthodox thing to do for a sannyasi because the local Brahmins there did not like Shankaracharya coming back to his mother um, as they thought he was bodily attached to her. So they did not um, cooperate. They did not even give him the fire to uh, light the dead body or any kind of help from wherever he came. So he took his mother's body to the backyard and uh, and he invoked the sun god. He invoked the sun god and um, they say the body um, was lit up in the pyre, spontane spontaneously burnt into flames without anybody's help. 
uh, through Shankaracharya's prayer and his intense tapas. And then he cooked the food in his mother's home as the last meal for the ritual that needed to be done. And they said um, nobody helped him, nobody did anything, but he did it on his own. And then he put three patals that used to be leaf uh, uh, in traditional Indian setting. They would give you um, the... Uh, you would make the plates made of, of leaves and then you would wash it. So he may, he put three spots uh, and all the Brahm, uh, Brahmins were watching, not contributing, not cooperating, but just disgusted and uh, in their own unorthodox, in their own orthodox way, not accepting the sannyasi at all. And then he, with the three plates he made, he invoked Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh. And they say all three came and they accepted the food and the conse consecration that he offered with so much love and devotion. So they said um, today, this is this is even current history, even today the Brahmins who had uh, rebuked him, so their ancestors and the whole village curses themselves. They feel they committed such a horrible sin against such a pure Brahmin and somebody who is so revered that uh, as to, to repent uh, what they did to Shankaracharya, they do to their own uh, people when they depart. So they bury their dead in, the, in their backyards as a, as a traditional custom even today. So such is the impact of, uh, of sages and saints and uh, how they can just change the the total tra trajectory without cursing, without getting angry or anything. So um, right then, his Guruji was also getting very old, Govinda Padacharyaji, and he also um, blessed Shankaracharyaji for his immense volume of work that he had already done, and then he departed from this earth as well. So now Shankaracharyaji was totally by himself, no attachments, mother is gone, Guru is also now merged in the universe, so um, Shankaracharyaji immersed himself and he started having several open debates with, in a very gentle and compassionate manner. And people would be um, hating or being very upset to say, who is this young sannyasi making such a big change? And then when they would meet him in person, they would be totally charmed by his aura, by his gentle persuasion and convincing. He would not, he would not argue. He would just uh, learn and, and teach them facts from which they really learned all about uh, the Advaita philosophy and Sanatana Dharma started to gain ground back and the philosophy started to pick up. So um, that is where he, um, and it used to be done in open debates where people would, would watch and so all the disciples uh, would then uh, come on the side of Sanatan Dharma. The, the stakes were high. He said, if, you, if I lose, I'll convert to you and if you guys lose, you come on this side. And this is how Sanatana Dharma was revived for all the people that, who, that had converted, not knowing um, what their true religion truly meant. So that is what he did for, um, um, for a lot of people, therefore, um, this homage that we are paying is is just such a drop in the bucket. But um, but we are extremely honored that such a man ever walked on this earth. His remaining life was extremely active in traveling all over India. He crisscrossed. He created the sannyas orders, the four peters, as I said, they still exist today. And um, there is an unbroken chain of Shankaracharyas even today in all those four peters. And that those positions are for life and they follow all the traditions and the norms and so on. In the east is the Govardhan Peet, which is the Rig Veda, based on the Rig Veda principles. In north, there is the Jyotirmath Peet based on the Atharva Veda. In the west, there is the Dwarka Peet uh, based on Sama Veda. And in the south, it's Shringeri Sharada Peetam Yajur Veda. And each of Shankaracharya's direct disciples started those Peetas back. Uh, back when he was departing. So he created all that infrastructure that is still holding today. So imagine his vision, the creativity, the effort, the administration, uh, the philosophy, the bhakti. So all the things that he created is just mind-blowing that how could such a person 
who one person with no resources puts so much together. So this is what determination and drive can do. Uh, he then wrote commentaries on the scriptures, so many of them, Brahma Sutras, Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita. Then um, he wrote a scripture called the Vivek Chudamani. It's 581 verses of philosophical discourses, which is considered, Vivek means uh, discrimination and Chuda means, money means crest jewel. So it became the crest jewel and it's a very um, respected scripture in the uh, philosophical um, discourses and uh, knowledge, uh, very highly regarded scripture as well. Then he created Uptesh Sahasri, Atma Bodha and several devotional hymns too. So uh, this combination of extreme bhakti and extreme jnana, uh, Gana is knowledge. So very uh, spiritual knowledge where he could debate with the highest of philosophers and bhakti where he created this um, little um, um, devotional um, Bhaj Govindam. So Govindam was, Govinda Pada was the name of his guru and Govinda is also the name of Krishna and God. So beautifully he has composed that. So um, he had the, the heart and the head and the hands. So he did tremendous amount of work. So I hope um, we all um, can mentally pay our uh, respects, humbly prostrate to this great saint, Sri Adi Shankaracharya Ji, and we invoke his blessings upon all of us and may his teachings of Advaita, non-duality, continue to radiate light and remove all darkness from this world. May we all continue to progress spiritually as we start his first book on Bhaj Govindam. So we will start this um, soon and um, there are 31 verses and then we will do more of his works at a later date. Um, Om Tat Sat, divine blessings to all of you. May Lord Shankaracharya and all the sages and saints of the world bless you. You are on this path of spirituality, which is the most blessed path there is. Everything else, as we know, is transient. This is Swami Nekhilananda. Om Tat Sat. <laughs>